Um, so as I said, I'm going to spend uh, uh, most of this going to be pretty light, pretty easy to, uh, to get through for the last session of the day. Uh, we're going to look at uh, just uh, uh, examples of testing a bunch of fairly common scenarios, and hopefully there'll be some, uh, some little tidbits you can pick up along the way that uh, you'll be able to go back and start applying uh, right away uh, Monday morning when you get back, get back to the office and uh, hopefully are excited to start uh, taking advantage of a bunch of stuff that, that you learned this week. All right, um, just very quickly, most of you have uh, already heard a, a little bit about OCI, so I won't spend a whole lot of time uh, as we're at the, the end of the week here. I think most of you have, have, uh, have heard me uh, talk a little bit about this. If you've got any questions at all about OCI or how we can help you out, please come see me or drop me an email and be happy to do that. Um, uh, remember that, the, so Grail, Grail's OCI is the new home of the Grails framework, uh, has been for the last year or so. Um, OCI is based in St. Louis, Missouri. We've been in business for almost 25 years and have been an open source company the whole time. Uh, about a year ago we got started, there were only two of us on the team at OCI and that was Graham and myself. And since then we've grown the team to, uh, there are 12 of us right now, uh, three here in Europe and nine back in the States. Uh, and uh, we're growing the team, uh, so if you're interested in uh, talking to us about uh, maybe joining the team, uh, send me a note at grailsjobs at ociweb.com, and, uh, and we'd, we'd love, to, uh, love to hear from you. Um, so we'll get uh, right, into, uh, right into the tech talk. Uh, so as I said, I'm going to work through a number of examples. We're just going to look at code samples of how to test uh, a bunch of different scenarios, and um, Hopefully there'll be some pieces of this that you can pick up and, and take back and immediately start taking advantage of. So domain classes, we'll start with uh, uh, kind of a really, really simple case. Um, in a domain class, often, so, so there's a whole debate about uh, uh, rich domain models versus anemic domain models, and uh, it could be the case that uh, your own preference is, your own preference is to, to have a lot of logic in your domain classes. If you do have logic in your domain classes, then uh, you should test that logic just like you would test logic in any class. Any place you've got logic in your application, you wanna be, uh, you wanna be testing that. In this case, th there's not really much logic in this class, and this is how I typically uh, author domain classes, is my domain classes are written to focus on describing the model, right? Describing the domain, the stuff that I wanna persist. And uh, so that includes properties like first name, last name, and an age. And uh, the, really, in general, the only other code that I have in domain classes, aside from declaring the persistent properties, are things like constraints. Uh, and if I've got any custom ORM mapping, I'll have the mapping block there. Um, and, and maybe under certain circumstances, I might have some callbacks like before validate or a before insert, after update, uh, some of those sorts of persistence related things. But in particular, what I don't have in my domain classes is, uh, is business logic and stuff like that. Um, but uh, as he said, there's a whole argument and debate to be had about rich domain models. Um, if, uh, if you've got logic in your domain classes, test it. I often don't. So there's not a whole lot to test in a, in a domain class uh, for the, the style of domain classes that I write, but there are some things, and uh, constraints are an example. Um, and t testing your, your constraints is really uh, even more important if you're writing custom validators where you've got real code in there. Here I'm, I'm gonna test, uh, that, uh, I'm test using one of the built-in validators, and just the test will describe that I've expressed the, uh, the correct constraint here. So I've got a domain class with a first name, last name, and age, and I've got a rule that says the age has to be at least zero and cannot be greater than 120. That's, uh, that, that's our rule. Uh, so here's a test that I could use uh, to test that. And even in this simple test, there's quite a, there, there are several kind of interesting things to talk about here. Uh, first, we see at the, at the very top, we see this test is annotated with at test for person. And test for is an annotation that's provided by Grails. And you'll often use test for in your, uh, in your unit tests. And the thing that you're passing as an argument to the test for annotation there, the thing you're applying uh, as, as the value of the attribute there for the test for annotation, is some artifact type. And in this case, it's person. So that, that's a, a domain class. Uh, but I could also have a service class there, a controller, a tag lib, any kind of Grails artifact. For a domain class in particular, there's not a whole lot of interesting things, at least not, not stuff that I want to talk about today that relates to um, uh, test for, for a domain class. When we get to uh, uh, some other examples, other, not domain classes, some other artifact types, I'll get back to test for 
and we'll uh, discuss some specific details that relate to other artifact types. Uh, but we do need the test for annotation here um, uh, in order to interact with our uh, uh, domain class and have, uh, have certain things in this test behave the way that I want them to. So more on test for later. So we've got a class called person spec that extends specification and specification of course is uh, that spock.lang.specification. Spock is a super duper cool, super powerful unit testing framework. Uh, even if you're not using Grails, you should be using Spock for writing unit tests. Even if you're not using Groovy, there's really no good reason to not be using Groovy, but if you're not using Groovy, uh, you can still use Spock to, to unit test your Java code or uh, really any JVM code. There's all kinds of cool stuff in Spock. As I said, it's just a really powerful, really flexible testing framework. We're going to be able to look at uh, a few features offered by Spock, but uh, I'm a, a big fan of the framework and encourage you to look at it if you're not already using it. Uh, we make, so Spock is the default testing framework um, in Grails 3. So when you start creating tests in Grails 3, when you create artifacts in Grails 3 and we create a test for you, by default we create a test that extends specification or some other class that extends specification indirectly. Uh, because, the, so uh, the Spock is the default testing framework. You don't have to use Spock. If you wanted to write JUnit tests or use some other testing framework, you can do that. We just, we put Spock there by default and that's what 99% of Grails developers are going to use because uh, there, there's really no good reason not to do that. All right. Uh, we've also got, uh, so there's one test method. Uh, there's kind of one test method and kind of not. So we'll start with the idea that there's one test method in this class and it's called test age validation. So notice I just skipped over the unroll annotation. We're going to come back to that momentarily. So we've got a test method called test age validation. Here, here, here's an interesting little Spock-ism that uh, uh, the conventional way that uh, people define their uh, test methods is what you see here. And they define the test method name as a string. So you can put spaces in there, it's just a string. So any, any character that's valid in a string can be used in your, in your method name. As opposed to the way this is typically done with, uh, like if you were writing JUnit Java tests, you'd have a test method called test age validation. And the method name would be camel case, but there wouldn't be spaces in there. But uh, so Spock makes it easy for you to write uh, test methods that have very readable names. So the test method is called test age validation. Uh, this is a very simple test. There's only one expectation being expressed here. So under the expect block, what we've got is, uh, notice one thing we don't have in the expect block is something like assert equals or the assert keyword. There really, there's no mention of assert at all there. And the way this works in a Spock spec is under the expect label can be any number of, of uh, expressions. In this case, there's only one. And when the test runs, those expressions get evaluated. And if the expression evaluates to true, then that part of the test has passed. And if that uh, expression evaluates to false, then you'll get that that's effectively a failed assertion. So there's an implicit, uh, you can think of it as an implicit assert in the front of all of these expressions. So it's like assert new person dot validate equals something, but you don't have to put the assertion there. Just put expressions there and they get evalu evaluated as if they were assertions. All right, uh, so what this expression is doing is creating an instance of the person class and assigning some value to the age property. And that value is whatever person age points to, but we don't, don't see yet where that gets a value, but uh, person age has some value and we're gonna assign that to the age property. Then I wanna validate the person after doing that. I've created a person, I've assigned a value to the age and I wanna validate it. And I wanna come back to the age inside of brackets there in just a minute. So for now, just know that we're creating a person, assigning a value to the age property and validating it. And then asserting that the validate method returns should be valid, right? Should be valid. So there are two variables in that expression, person age and should be valid. Uh, so let's jump down to the where block and the where block, think of that where block as, uh, as a table. And the first row is the header row that, so there's a heading on each of these columns and there can be any number of columns. We just happen to have two columns here. And the header row is where we see person age uh, and should be valid. And then below that are any number of, uh, any number of rows. So we've got, one, two, three, four, we've got eight rows in this table below the header row. So the way this works is that expect block gets executed over and over again, once for every row in this table. And each time the expect block uh, executes, the variables person age and should be valid will take on the values that correspond to that column in the table, right? 
So the first time uh, the expect block gets, ex gets executed, person age will have a value of negative two and should be valid will have a value of false. So what we're, do what we're expressing there is if I create a person whose age is negative two, then I expect the validate method to return false. That's what's expressed there. The same with, with negative one. If the person's age is negative one, I expect the validate method to return false. If it's 0, 1, 119, or 120, I expect the validate method to return true. And then at the other end of the, um, of the table here, if age is 121 or 122, I expect validate to return false. So I can kind of infer here, so I could make this table really long and I could have all the values from 0 to 120 there, but this is a, this is a reasonable way to test this and that is I'm, I'm testing the boundary conditions, right? I'm testing two numbers below the minimum value and two numbers above the minimum value, uh, above the maximum value, and then two numbers just inside the boundaries at each end. So from looking at this test, I might guess that the valid values for the age property should be 0 through 120. Right. So that's a, that's a reasonable uh, kind of thing to infer from, from that test. Let's circle back around and uh, talk about the two things that I skipped over. And that is one of them is uh, when I call dot validate, uh, you see age inside of square brackets there. The inside of square brackets there is really a list of strings. There's only one string in this case, but it's a list of strings. There could be any number of strings there. Um, by default, when you call dot validate and don't pass any arguments, what happens is all of the validators in this class get executed. So the first name validator, the last name validator, and the age validator. It doesn't look like the first name and last name properties have validators, but they do. Remember that all of your persistent properties in Grails uh, are default to nullable false, right? They're not nullable. So it, it, implicit is first name space nullable colon false. So even though we don't see first name and last name expressed there, they are in fact constrained properties. And when I call dot validate on this instance of person, since those values are null, uh, validate's gonna return false, right? Validation's gonna fail for those properties. So one way I could deal with that is when I create the person, I could assign values to the first name and the last name. And in a simple case like this, that wouldn't be that big of a deal, right? I could just hard code a couple of strings and, and be good to go. But often in a, in a real application, you've got a complicated domain class with maybe a lot of stuff in it. And maybe that thing's got relationships to other things and those things might have relationships to other things still. And you, you don't wanna have to create this graph of objects or create a bunch of data just to make the validation fail for all of those other non-nullable properties when really all we're trying to test here is the validation of the age property. So uh, this is a common thing that I do in unit tests and that is uh, when I'm testing uh, that the age constraint is expressed correctly, I'll create the person, I don't care about any of the other properties, I just want to initialize the age property and then when I call dot validate and pass this list of strings, the values in that list represent the names of properties that I want to validate. There are also ways to take advantage of that in your real application, right? Not just in a test, but if you're building up state of an object as you go, so you create a person and you want to make sure the age is valid, and if it is, then carry on to the next step and gather the first name and last name, as an example. Uh, you could do the same sort of thing, right? So the, the option to pass uh, property names as an argument to the validate method is not peculiar to test. It just turns out that's where I almost always take advantage of it. Does that make sense? Any questions about the validation uh, limiting the number of properties that are being validated there? Is this good? All right, very good. Uh, the last thing I want to look at in this test is the unroll annotation. And to talk about that, I'm going to jump over here to an IDE and run the real test. All right, let's see what this, uh, what this test looks like. So it's, it's building right now. I'm going to run it in the IDE. And the way it's written right now, uh, the test is going to pass. There we go. There we go. So we got green bars. Um, remember I said it, it kind of looks like we've got one test method, uh, but I was a little hesitant about that because what we've really got is eight test methods, right? Um, so if we look down here, You'll see uh, validate on a person with age negative two should have returned false and so forth. You see all those method names there. Um, and that's uh, the unroll annotation is uh, related to that. What the, uh, the unroll annotation is a Spockism. It's not a Grailsism. Um, 
And uh, the way the unroll annotation works is when you've got a test like this that is using a where block to provide a, a table of data that, that represents uh, scenarios you want to test, you can apply the unroll annotation to that test method and the string that you supply to the unroll annotation becomes the name of the test method. And in that string, you can use these uh, tokens, pound some variable name. Uh, here's another one, pound some variable name. And those get uh, some substitution takes place so that the first time this gets executed and person age is negative two and should be valid as false, the test method name that gets created for that scenario has negative two right here and has negative one right there. So if we go back over here and look at these names, you see where that came from. Validate on person with age negative two should have returned false. So now I've got a scenario where from looking at the test method, I can tell what scenario was being tested there. Uh, contrast that with what happens if I don't use the unroll. And what we're gonna see, well, what I really wanna do is I wanna make the test fail. So let's get rid of the constraint for a moment. So I, I've commented out the, um, the age constraint. The test that's running right now is gonna pass because I started the test before I made that change. But uh, I'll run it one more time. And now uh, two, uh, four of the tests should pass and four of them should fail. And that's what happened. Uh, notice over here, we don't have eight test methods anymore. We've got one test method called test age validation. So now I gotta know, well, I'm not sure which scenario was problematic. So I need to go over here and look around and I, I can figure it out fairly easily, right? I can look at this and I can see that person age was negative two and, um, but, but this is not very easy to look at, right? I can figure it out, but a, a better way to deal with that problem is with the unroll thing and now when uh, we'll have those eight test methods again, and I can tell from looking at the test method name which scenario was problematic. All right, so down here, I see that the red ones are the ones that failed and the green ones are the ones that passed. So I can tell validate on person, on a person with age negative two should have returned false. That describes the scenario that I was testing, right? I'm not parsing through a bunch of text. I can look at the test method name and uh, tell the scenario that was problematic. Does that make sense? Questions about any of that? Thumbs up for good feature? It's a very good feature, it's cool stuff. All right, let me leave this in a passing state here. Out of that. All right, uh, let's talk about testing controllers. Often there's more interesting things to test than a controller. Uh, so here I've got a controller with a couple of actions defined in it, an action called index and an action called create widget. And the create widget action accepts a widget as, a, as an argument, right? So imagine there's some logic inside of the create widget method that I want to test. Um, often what folks will do when they're testing this kind of controller action in, uh, in a Grails app is uh, they recognize that the create widget method accepts a parameter so if your unit test is gonna call that method, we've gotta create a widget and pass it in as an argument. Um, but it turns out you don't have to do that. Uh, so let's see uh, why that is. So this is a test for testing that controller action. I wanna test uh, that um, uh, whatever's going on in the create widget uh, method or create widget action. So this test is creating some request parameters, params.width equals four, params.height equals seven. Um, and params.name equals fidget. And then the first line after that where it says controller.createWidget, uh, notice I'm not passing an argument there. So I'm not creating a widget and passing it into this method. I'm calling a, a version of that method that does not accept any parameters. Notice there, there's not a version of the method that doesn't accept any parameters. Um, so something's gotta give here. It turns out there is a version of that method that accepts no parameters, and that's the method that the framework actually calls at runtime when a request comes into your application and you've set up your URL mappings to lead to this, this action. The Grails is not calling the method that you see here. Grails is calling a version of create widget that accepts no parameters. And that method is created at compile time. We've got an AST transformation in Grails that goes through all of your controllers and looks for controller actions that accept uh, command object parameters. And if we find one, then what the compiler is gonna do is create another method with the same name, create widget, that accepts no parameters. And what that method, the code that gets added inside of that method, what it does is it creates a widget 
it subjects the widget to data binding, then it uh, subjects the widget to dependency injection, then it validates the widget, and then finally calls this method that you wrote. So there's, there's quite a bit of stuff going on before your code ever gets executed. And the way this test is written, we're executing that same path of logic that gets executed when the real application is running. So that's really a better way to test uh, your application. If we were to create a widget here and pass it explicitly as an argument, then we're bypassing uh, logic that gets executed in your real application, which is not great, right? We want the unit test to follow uh, a path that's as consistent as is practical with the path that the real application is taking. So the way to supply of request parameters is what you see here, params.width equals something, params.height equals something. You can populate params with as many parameters as, as makes sense for this particular test. And then just invoke the controller action that accepts no parameters and let Grails do the thing that it does. It's really not, it's the code that's inside of your controller, but it's code that we, that's inside of your controller only because Grails generated it for you at compile time. Uh, but uh, an approach like this uh, is, is the way that I would test controller actions that accept uh, command object parameters, as opposed to creating the widget myself and passing it in. Make sense? Questions about any of that? Yes, go ahead. So, what I'm hearing is that when I put in the parameters, that would be as if they were put in a do. And then when the control action is run, then it data binds to the widget. That is true. Okay. That's right. So, uh, that's true at runtime and at test time. So, I'll, I'll restate that. Um, so when a request comes into this application or when our unit test calls the create widget method that accepts no parameter, the same thing happens in both scenarios, uh, what Grails is going to do is create an instance of the widget class, uh, subject it to data binding, meaning grab the request parameters and bind them to the corresponding properties in the widget class, then the other things that I described earlier happen, but once the widget has been processed and set up, then it's passed as an argument into the create widget method. So here, uh, since I populated the parameters of uh, the width, height, and name parameters, when I call the create widget method that accepts no parameters, all that stuff happens. And what's really being asserted in the then block is that the widget was created and that the data binding behaved as we expected. So if we had any custom data binding stuff in place, uh, we could assert that the custom data binding stuff did what it's supposed to do here. Yep. Uh, there's a feature that we introduced, or a change in behavior that we introduced, I think in Grails 2.0, it was 2. something. I think it might have been 2.0. But uh, um, we changed the default behavior of the data binder such that if a, uh, if a when data binding is happening um, using your request parameters, when a, a property, when a request parameter is being bound to a string property, uh, we'll trim the string before doing the data binding. And then separate, but after that, uh, before doing the data binding, if a string is empty, it gets converted to null, right? So if you uh, invoke the mass data binder with an empty string, uh, what actually gets bound is null. By default, the data binder converts an empty string to null. And at a glance, that seems like the wrong thing, right? An empty string is an empty string. That's not null. Why, why would we do that? Uh, but in the context of a web app, in particular, that makes sense because um, when you're filling out, say you're filling out a form in a, in a browser and you leave a field blank and click submit, um, what gets sent is an empty string. There, there's no way, there's no simple way to represent it in request parameters uh, a null, right? You can have the string null, but now you've got to make a distinction between does that mean null or does that mean the string null? So when you're filling out a form and you leave some things blank and submit that form, the value of those corresponding request parameters are actually empty strings. And most often what you want is you want to treat uh, the system, you want the system to treat that as if the property wasn't there, that it didn't have a value. So by default, the data binder converts an empty string to null when the data binding is happening. Uh, but you get to turn that off, right? And a way to do that in Grails 3 is in application YAML, you can assign a value to grails.databinding.convertEmptyStrings to null and assign false. So that turns off the default behavior. That says don't convert empty strings to null. So now we've got a, a test that covers that scenario. What happens when params.name is an empty string? This test is asserting that widget.name is an empty string. 
if, uh, and this test will pass if our application.yaml includes the config that you see at the top there, which is not there by default. Um, so by default, if you were to, so if, so if you weren't turning that, val that uh, setting off, the last assertion in this test would fail, right? Because widget.name would be null. Make sense? All right, very good. Uh, and there's another property. There's a property for convert empty strings to null, and there's another, uh, I think it's called trim, trim strings before binding. There's another property that has to do with trimming strings. Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but uh, so there's two different things going on there. One is str strings are trimmed before data binding, and empty strings are converted to null before, uh, before data binding. All right, let's talk a little bit about testing services. Oh, you know, I forgot one more thing I want to point out about testing controllers. So this test is annotated with that test for demo controller, right? So we saw test for person before, and now we're looking at test for demo controller. And so there's, there's an AST transformation that's invoked when, all, when your tests are, are marked with that test for, and that AST transformation will look at the class that you've supplied to test for, in this case, demo controller, and we'll figure out what kind of artifact is that. Is it a controller? Is it a service? Is it a domain class? Is it a tag lib? And then the, the AST transformation, remember this is happening at compile time, uh, the AST transformation does different things to this test for different artifact types. Uh, as an example, since, this, since the AST transformation can figure out that this is a test for a controller, because we've got demo controller there, uh, one of the things the uh, transformation will do is it adds the params property to this test, because that makes sense, right? If you're testing a controller, you're probably going to want access to the params. Uh, the transformation also adds a property called controller to this test. And not only does it add the property called controller, it initializes that property, right? So nowhere here do we see controller equals new demo controller. Uh, about five or six lines into the test method there, we just call controller.widget. We don't declare it, we don't initialize it, it's just there, and it will be an instance of the demo controller class. Uh, and more has, ha you know, other things have happened other than it just being initialized. Uh, that thing has been subjected to data uh, dependency injection, uh, not data binding, but uh, dependency injection. So if I define some beans in my Spring application context, and there are corresponding properties in the demo controller class, uh, the dependency injection will have happened before any of this code executes, right? So if I want to test a controller, I don't want to create the controller myself. I want to let the test for annotation instruct the compiler to, to let it do that. And then uh, my code, is, it, just, it doesn't get executed until all that has happened. And the controller's been initialized, it's been dependency injected, and it's, it's ready to go, right? So different things happen at compile time to your tests for different artifact types. Uh, so here we've got a service called uh, money service, and the service is annotated with uh, at transa transactional. We've got um, what's what's relevant here is we've got a uh, reference to a uh, bank service, and in a real application, I would probably statically type that reference, but it's uh, dynamically typed here. Def bank service, uh, and I've got a method called get bank names that uh, reaches out to the bank service to retrieve some bank names and then convert them to uppercase. We've just got some logic here, so we've got something to test. What's important is I've got a service that depends on another service, and the first service has some logic in it. The other service, in this case, uh, bank service at the bottom, has a hard-coded list of strings there. But it could be the case that uh, in, inside of get bank names there at the bottom, we're making a REST call, or maybe we're talking to the database. We've, we've got some complicated work to be done, um, and, uh, and that might be fine. But when I test the money service class, I don't necessarily want to have to engage whatever expensive operations might be in the bank service class, right? So the bank service class could have logic in it that I don't want to execute in order to test the logic in the money service class, but the money service class is interacting with that bank service. So something's got to give there. So one way I could go about testing this is, uh, is what you see here. So we've got uh, a spec that is annotated with that test for money service. So uh, there'll be a property added to this test called service, and that property will be initialized to be an instance of money service, and that property will have been subjected to dependency injection before my test executes. So at the top of my test, notice there is a do with spring property there, static do with spring equals closure. 
And the syntax of what I can do inside of that do a spring block is the same syntax I could use in resources.groovy, right? I can, I can add bean definitions here. And in this case, so one thing I could do is I could add the real bank service to the spring application context. That could say bank service, uppercase B bank service as an argument instead of dummy bank service. I could plug in the real bank service. But often, when in your unit tests, when I'm testing the money service, uh, I want to, as, as much as I can, I want to eliminate any external dependencies, right? I want to test the stuff in the banks in the money service. I want to get the bank service out of the mix. But the money service depends on the bank service, kind of. It doesn't really depend on the bank service. It depends on some thing being assigned to that bank service property. So instead of using the real bank service, which might be expensive, right? Maybe it's making rest calls or doing complicated math. And instead of using the real one, I want to plug in a dummy one. And uh, that's, that's being done here. So I've got a class in my test called dummy bank service. And it uh, provides an implementation for the get bank names method. And instead of doing something complicated and expensive, it's simply returning a string of bank, a list of bank names, bank one, bank two, bank three. Now, uh, back up in the test method, when I retrieve the value of the bank names property, I can uh, make assertions based on what that returns. And in this case, what I expect it to return is bank one, bank two, bank three, all uppercase. Even though, so what I'm really testing there is that the money service reached out to the bank service to get the bank names and that whatever bank names came back from the bank service got converted to uppercase. And I can test all of that logic Right? There's not a lot, it's only one line of code here, but I can test all the logic in the get banks names in the get bank names method without needing to engage the real bank service. I'm, I'm testing the logic in get bank names. Whatever logic is in the real bank service class also needs to be tested, but that would be its own unit test, right? Here I'm focusing on the logic that's in the money service class. Does that make sense? Anyone argue with that approach? Good. All right. Uh, let's look at an example or s several examples of testing tag libraries. This is something that uh, I've, uh, I've just found over the years. A lot of, a lot of folks don't know how to test uh, uh, GSP tags, so they don't. But there's, uh, there's pretty simple stuff in, in the framework for, for testing tag libraries. So here I've got a tag library that has a couple of tags in it. We've got a say hello tag and a repeat tag. The say hello tag grabs the value of an attribute and makes it part of the response, and the repeat tag grabs the value of an attribute, and then renders the body over and over again is what's going on there. Um, so let's look at uh, a test for how I might test that say hello tag. So because I annotated this test case with that test for helper tag lib, uh, there's an AST transformation that recognizes that I'm testing a tag lib, and uh, tag lib stuff gets added to this, to this test case. One of the things that gets added to this test case is an apply template method. And the way the apply template method works is you can pass as an argument to the apply template method a string that represents anything that would be valid inside of a GSP. So I've got some markup here that, that I might have used in a GSP. That string gets evaluated as a GSP and what the apply template method returns is whatever uh, that GSP code would have rendered, right, if, if, it, were in a, if it were in a GSP. So what I'm, what I'm testing here is that when I call say hello and specify name equals Jeff, that the tag will render hi there Jeff, right? And that's consistent with what we see up here in the, uh, in the say hello tag. So the say hello tag relies on a name attribute and we're supplying a value for that name attribute in the markup that you see here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what, are we talking about controller actions? Yeah. So you would test controller actions with a controller test. No, no, no. Uh, in the tag lib, you can, within the tag lib, you can say, okay, if, it's, if uh, the tag lib was called for this controller action, you should do this. And from the, the, the action name gets transferred to the tag lib. Yeah, so if what you're, we're really talking about is, um, I don't have an example here. Uh, there's another ver there's an overloaded version of apply template that accepts a map as a parameter, and uh, so and so if you supply a map, that map becomes the model. So if you've got code inside of your GSP that's referring to variables like the action name, it's just a, just a variable as far as your GSP is concerned. You get to supply values for those variables. And just to be clear, let me jump out here to an IDE and I'll show you what I'm talking about. 
Uh, what is that test called? So I should buy the controller of the method name instead of the controller. Yeah, there's no controller involved here, and, and, and that's important. You don't want to involve a controller when unit testing your taglib. So here, if I had a map uh, that said, uh, uh, I don't want to use name, that'll complicate things. Home is STL, and uh, country is USA. Could be action name, it doesn't matter what values you put in here. Now, inside of this GSP, if I were to do um, that, right, if that's what the GSP code looks like, um, uh, let's see, that's not going to work because of, yeah, it will, because we're inside of a single quoted string. Now, these values, uh, th that's consistent with, uh, so think of a controller returning a model that had some data in it. This map represents the model that'll be used when this is evaluated. And if, action, if you were referring to action name in, this, in your, in here, then you would, uh, action name could be included in this map. Yep. There we go. Uh, where are we at? All right. So apply template accepts a string parameter that represents anything that would be valid uh, markup in a GSP. Um, we can test a tag that has a body associated with it, right? So we're invoking the same method we were invoking before. That's apply template and we're passing a string. This time the, uh, the string happens to represent a tag that has a body. And what I expect that uh, to evaluate to is the body, the body, the body, the body, right? Uh, four times. I expect the body to be repeated that many times. So I'm testing uh, a tag that does something with, it, with the body. Right, it's all that's represented there. Another way to, um, yeah, another thing I might want to test is uh, notice this time the difference between this test where I'm specifying a count and this test is I'm not specifying a count. And the test is asserting that what I get back is the body three times. So we've got a default value here. We've got a rule that says if you don't supply a value for the count attribute, then we'll default it to, to three. Maybe I should point this out. This isn't a unit testing thing. It's just a tag lib thing and uh, elsewhere as well that I'll, I'll clarify. But uh, these attributes um, are, are typically the, value are, are going, the values are going to be strings, not numbers. And I want this thing, I need a number that represents um, this, right? I want to convert that string to a number. So what some folks will do is here they'll have adders.count.to integer adders.count.to integer. Uh, that's problematic for uh, at least a couple of reasons. One, if adders.count can't be converted to a number, you're going to get a number format exception. And if adders.count doesn't exist, that would throw a null pointer exception. You can't say adders.count.to adders integer if adders.count is null. A better way to do that, that if what you want to do is grab the value of one of these attributes and convert it to a number, for example, um, you can invoke a method whose name corresponds to any of the eight primitive types. So you've got boolean, byte, char, short, float, double, long, and uh, int. Maybe I skipped. Um, so, so you've got the, the names of all the eight primitive types uh, have corresponding methods on this thing. And you can, pass one or you can pass an argument that represents the name of the attribute that you want to convert to an int. And then optionally, you get to specify a default value. Right, so the, what's, what's expressed here is if there's not a count attribute, then I want to use the number three. Just, it's just a simple way to provide a default value. The exact same syntax, that same AP, the same methods are available on params in your, um, uh, in a controller, right? So in a controller, uh, often you want to retrieve the value of a request parameter and turn it into a number. Um, so in your controller, say params.int, you use the same approach that you see here. That's handy stuff. Uh, so the, the mechanisms we've seen so far for testing, uh, testing a tag is we use apply template and pass a string that represents markup that could be in a GSP. Another way to test your um, tag libs is to test them as method calls. So since this test is annotated with test for helper tag lib, uh, the compiler recognizes that this is a test for a tag library. So it adds a property called tag lib to this class. And just like the other types, uh, the tag lib is initialized and uh, it's subjected to dependency injection. So that's the thing that you want to interact with. Um, so if I wanted to test these uh, methods or test these uh, tags as method calls, um, the syntax you see here is how I would do that. Right? I can call say hello and pass a map. That map represents the attributes that get passed into the tag. 
I can call uh, repeat and pass a map or not pass a map, but uh, the, the interesting part for the repeat tests is notice that I'm passing a closure as the last argument. And whatever that closure evaluates to is, uh, corresponds to the body of the tag. Right? So here we've got the word yes being returned from the closure, where up here we've got the body space. So whatever that closure returns, that corresponds to the body of the tag. So um, uh, that, that's a, another way to test uh, GSP tags. So all that makes sense? All right. Lots of simple stuff, I think. All right. The framework provi or, uh, Jeb um, provides a, a class called JebSpec, and JebSpec is, um, uh, is a subclass of Spock's specification. I don't know if it directly extends specification, but somewhere up in the inheritance hierarchy is specification. So it's a Spock spec with some Jeb stuff um, added on top of it. I've annotated this test with at integration, and what that means is when this test runs, uh, Tomcat will be started up, and my whole application will be built and uh, brought into that, into that Tomcat before this test runs. So this is a, this is a, a real, it, it's really a functional test, right? The Tomcat's, Tomcat's running and the app is, is in that Tomcat. And I'm gonna come back to that stepwise annotation in, in just a minute. Uh, so here's an example of a, of a Jeb spec. And what Jeb is, is it, it's really, uh, so the way folks use it is it's a framework for writing functional tests for web apps. But what it really is, is it's a, a library for scripting interactions with a web browser, right? And you can use it for, uh, and people find interesting ways to use Jeb outside of writing tests. Maybe you've got an app, and you, uh, a web app, and you want to script interactions with it for some reason, you could use Jeb for that. Most often it's used for, uh, for writing functional tests. So I'll step through this and just kind of describe what's going on in this test. Um, so this is inside of this test class here. So I've got a test that extends Jeb spec and is annotated with that integration. And I've got a test method here that says, when I go to slash person slash create, then I expect the text of the title attribute to be create person. Right? So I don't want to get too deep in the woods and talk about uh, details of, of Jeb. I will stay at a fairly high level, but that's what's going on. Um, the go space string method, go space slash person slash create, what that does is that generates an HTTP request to that URL slash person slash create, and then it's a real HTTP request. This isn't mocked up like your controller unit tests. It's a real request. Um, then the response comes back, Jeb knows how to parse the response and uh, has a syntax for letting you navigate the DOM and make assertions about what's in the DOM. So in this case, as I said, I'm grabbing the title element in the page, retrieving the text from the title element and asserting that it is what I expect it to be. Then in the, the, the when block, the second when block, um, grabbing the form element that's in that page and this is interesting, right? That's filling out the form. That's uh, like you're typing, you're filling in Getty for the first name, Lee for the last name, and 63 for the age. So Jeb really does do that. It fills in the form and then finds the create button on that page and clicks create on that button. So what we've done is we've navigated to a web page, made an assertion about what the title of the page is. Uh, we filled out a form on the page and click submit and then we can make an assertion about what's in the following page. We expect the title to be show person. Um, and I can do the same thing again, right? So I've created two people. I've created Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson. Um, Jeb, uh, so, so there are a number of drivers available for Jeb. Uh, by default in your Grails application, we install a driver called uh, HTML unit. And the way, what HTML unit does is it, it doesn't start up a real browser, but it behaves as a browser. There's no GUI to it, but uh, it, it can send HTTP requests, it can get responses, and can parse the responses. And so it, it simulates a browser, but it's not a real browser. There are also drivers uh, for uh, most of the major browsers. So there's a, a Firefox driver and a Chrome driver, I think. And if you're using those, when you run this test, you'll actually see the browser come up and you'll see forms being filled out and you can tell what's going on. And uh, Jeb does some interesting things like uh, if the test fails, what Jeb will do is take a screenshot of the browser in that w when the test failed and make that part of the test reports. So w not only do you see that a test failed, you can see what was in the browser at that point and often that's, uh, that, that's critical in figuring out what's going on. So Jeb does all kinds of cool stuff like that. 
Um, so the, the, only, the, the assertions that we're making up here are as simple as just grabbing the title element from a page, retrieving its text, and then saying, uh, or making an assertion about what we expect that text to be. Um, there's uh, all kinds of sophisticated stuff you can do to navigate the DOM. Here is just a one kind of simple-ish simple example. But what's expressed here is if I go to slash person slash index, I expect, uh, I expect there to be a TR element in the page, and I expect the first TR element to have a TD in it whose text is Getty. And I expect the first TR element in the page to also have a TD element whose text is Lee. I expect the second one to have a T, uh, the second TR to have a TD in it whose name is Alex and so forth. You can probably look at that and kind of guess what's going on there. Um, but what, what the application is supposed to do is create an HTML table with some rows in it, one row for each of the persons, right? And the data that you see here is consistent with uh, persons that were created in the test up above. And if I look at the real test, person crud functional spec, here's the, the real test. Um, you'll see that test creating people is above uh, test retrieving people. And that's important because this is making assertions about stuff that's in the web page that would not be there if this hadn't happened, right? We're, we're creating people and then viewing people. The creating people has to happen before the viewing people. And most often, uh, at least by default, that's not the way, you, know, you shouldn't, when you author unit tests or when you author tests at all, you shouldn't depend on the test running in a certain order. They're not guaranteed to run in any particular order. In a test like this, you need them to run in a certain order, right? You need the creates to happen before the, the second test. And that's what this stepwise annotation is about. When you annotate um, a Spock spec with stepwise, and this works in any Spock spec, not just Jeb specs, any Spock spec. When you annotate the spec with stepwise, uh, two, two interesting things happen as a result of that. One is that the test methods are executed in the order that they're specified in your file. And as soon as you encounter a failed test, the test runner stops. It won't carry on with the rest of the test. And that makes sense because the reason that you want to execute things in order is that one test depends on another test happening before it. And as soon as one fails, you already know that the system's in a bogus state. So there's no reason to carry on with the other tests. They may fail for reasons that don't really relate to what's in that test. So that's what the stepwise annotation's about. Uh, yeah, go ahead. That's right, it does. Does, does. does that mean that bootstrap uh, phase of the application is running as well? So you can actually put data in the server database? Yeah, the question is, uh, I, I said that if you annotate your, your spec with that integration, that that starts up Tomcat and bootstraps the real application. And then the question is, does that mean that bootstrap, the actual bootstrap code in your application, does it get executed? And the answer is yes. The application is started up and it's, it's running. So that includes running your bootstrap, that includes spinning up the Spring application, con the whole thing is running. In fact, while your test is running, if you opened up a browser and started, the, the app would be there and you could interact with it. It's, it's, it really is running. So there's an expense associated with that, right? It takes several seconds to start up Tomcat. Uh, and if you add hundreds of these integration tests, that's gonna, that's gonna pile up, or it seems like it might pile up, but it doesn't. Because of the way our test runner works, if you've got 100 integration tests, what we're going to do is we're going to start up one Tomcat, deploy the app, and then all your tests run against the same one. Yeah, so. But yeah, the, the full environment is spun up. Your, your application is running. The, the real thing is running inside of Tomcat. All right, we've got zero minutes. But uh, So very, very quickly, I'll point out one thing. And then I'm happy to hang around and talk about uh, anything that, uh, that folks might want to talk about. I'll point out just one quick feature here. Uh, that came up in uh, the uh, REST workshop the other day that, that I think is interesting. Uh, there are two classes that, that kind of serve uh, similar purposes. There's a, there's a REST client class and there's a REST builder class. And this example is using the REST client class and I would actually use the REST builder. It's, uh, uh, it's newer and has some, some interesting capabilities. REST client is, is kind of deprecated, but it behaves roughly the same way. But uh, notice that this spec, it's annotated with that integration. So I want the real application up and running inside of Tomcat. But I'm not extending Jeb spec. I'm extending specification. Um, because Jeb is a, is a tool for scripting interactions with a browser. And I don't, I don't need a browser to test a REST API. I just want to make HTTP requests to, uh, to my application. 
So what the REST client does is uh, it simplifies that quite a bit. So I can create an instance of the REST client class, provide some URL, and, uh, and then inside the test, when I call rest.get path colon albums, what that does is that generates a, a get request to uh, uh, albums gets appended to the URL that is specified up here. So it's slash albums. And then I can make some claims about, uh, about the response. Uh, just in the interest of time, because it's the end of the day, and I know uh, some of you are probably anxious to get out of here, I won't press into more details than that. But uh, just know that REST client and REST builder, uh, those classes are out there and they behave roughly like this. Uh, REST client behaves exactly like this and REST builder is, uh, is very similar to this. All of this code, that uh, the slides and the code that I'm looking at here um, is in a repository that is at uh, this URL and I'll just leave that up there while I'm uh, wrapping up here. Uh, I welcome you to go check that repository out. At the top of the repository is a readme that tells you how to generate the, the documentation, meaning these slides right here. These slides are generated from the real code that's in the project. So these code samples, that code sample we're looking at right there in the docs is coming out of the real test that's in the project. So uh, there's just some really interesting ASCII doctor stuff going on there to make that happen. Uh, just uh, two minutes and then we'll break it up and I'll hang around and answer whatever questions you might like. But any questions while the whole group is here? Yes. Spock is not part of Grails, but Grails ships with Spock. It's not part of Grails, that's right. At Jeb is its own library, right? You can, you can go to the Jeb website and download Jeb. Jeb is not part of Grails, we ship it with Grails. Anything else? All right, so I'm not trying to rush off. I'm here and happy to talk tech all night, uh, but uh, we'll go ahead and call it good for the day. I welcome you to come down and uh, let me know if there's anything at all that I can do with you. I hope you all really enjoyed the week, and uh, let me know if there's anything at all that I can do to help you out. Thank you all very much.